uh, we we join you virtually tonight from our, our respective homes to keep us all safe and to do the small things that we can to slow the spread of COVID. Um, and in the spirit of looking to the silver linings of COVID, uh, the move to this virtual platform tonight has enabled us to hear from Nick on the actual release date of Cross of Snow. So tonight, I'm very excited that we're among the very first to talk with Nick after publication of his new biography of Longfellow. Uh, tonight, Nick's going to give us a little window into his research for Cross of Snow, which spanned about 12 years and brought him to Longfellow House Washington's headquarters National Historic Site. After Nick's illustrated talk, he'll be joined by Longfellow House archivist Kate Hansen Plass for a conversation. And then uh, Nick will answer questions from you. So please send your questions as you have them to the uh, organizers only option by chat. So Nick has made a remarkable contribution to the body of scholarship around Longfellow with Cross of Snow. And all excitement about a fresh look at Henry aside, uh, one of the most compelling aspects of his book, in my opinion, is the way that Nick gives the poet's second wife, Fanny Longfellow, due recognition for the remarkable and creative woman that she was. Uh, at one point in the book, Nick writes about Fanny's art, saying that documenting things visually and in words matter to Fanny Appleton, uh, which was her maiden name. And, and I could say the same of Nick. Uh, Nick's background in journalism lends itself to bringing Longfellow's world to life for readers. Uh, Nick's words paint uh, evocative pictures that let us feel that history in a, a powerful way. Um, and I can tell you that I'm not the only person who cried while uh, reading the proof. Uh, Nick's book also brings to life the remarkable research that happens at the Longfellow House and the importance of the archives and collection that the National Park Service care for. Nick and other scholars like Nick uh, make visible the hidden world of research at the Longfellow House the world that's really not always apparent to the 65,000 visitors who come to see the house and learn about its history each year. So one of the great privileges of my job is that I get to meet people like Nick. Um, I don't know that Nick agrees with this, but I think he's found a kindred spirit in Longfellow. Uh, Nick is the author of 10 critically acclaimed books on cultural history, and he, like Longfellow, is especially interested in books and book culture. Nick's first book, A Gentle, a Gentle Madness, Bibliophiles, Bibliomanes, and the Eternal Passion for Books, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award for Nonfiction, and it was also a New York Times notable book. His later book on paper, Everything That's 2000 Year History, was one of three finalists for the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Nonfiction. It was named a Best Book of the Year by seven major publications. In 2016, Nick was awarded a Public Scholar Research Fellowship by the National Endowment for the Humanities to work on Cross of Snow. Um, and on the personal side, I can tell you that Nick is uh, genuinely a delightful person to spend time with, um, and his passion for Longfellow is just contagious. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Nick Basbanes and hand this evening over to him. And Nick, I will tell you, you're still on mute. So you got to unmute yourself. I am unmuted. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Thank you all for joining us virtually tonight. Originally, we had hoped that uh, this event would be on site in the garden, and it would have been quite spectacular because the Longfellow House is such a magnificent uh, uh, national historic site. And I'm trying to get my my uh, slide to go forward, but there we go. Okay, good, got the right button. And th there is a summer view of Longfellow House, Washington's headquarters, National Historic Site. Uh, please note that it has a, a double name because not only is it this, this magnificent structure that where Henry Longfellow lived for close to 50 years, we uh, had this remarkable idyllic relationship with Fanny Appleton when they had uh, six children, five of whom survived to adulthood, and where he wrote so many wonderful things, but, but uh, uh, where so many important people came and gathered, and, 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 we're, and, and it's time it became this, this cultural, uh, this mecca, this mecca for literary pilgrims who visited from all corners of the earth. It was uh, quite literally, it was, it was uh, proclaimed in 1906 as one of the two or three uh, 
best known residences in the United States, uh, up there with the White House and, and Mount Vernon. People came, this is what it looked like in 1853. This image appeared in uh, uh, Homes of American Authors and uh, both Fanny and Henry, of course, were they had been married at that point by, uh, for 10 years. And it was kind of what it looked like at the time. And here we come forward to an image uh, in 1878 uh, and a suite of images in uh, Scribner's Monthly. I like this particular image because it kind of shows you a, the north side of the house. The bedroom is up there on the second floor. Those two, uh, those two windows at the center is uh, where, the, where the master bedroom was. So it is quite a remarkable place. Now, I have to tell you, this image is quite wonderful. This is a chromolithograph. When we talk about Longfellow being this iconic figure and the house being this destination for literary pilgrims, uh, it, it appeared in not only in, in magazines and uh, what's, what passed for the paparazzi of the day, but it, it was uh, uh, issued uh, wonderful images like this, a chromolithograph uh, lithograph from McLaughlin Brothers. Uh, I really want to thank my editor, Vicki Wilson, at Cup for selecting this particular image and using it uh, as the front end sheet for the book. It's quite spectacular. We have a different image on the back with Boston Common in 1843. But the house, I, I, I take this time with these first few images to talk a little bit about it because not only is it, is it a very important place, but it, all, it also works for me, at least, as something of a character in the book. It, it really, it, we talk about the power of place and the power of objects, the power of documents helping shape. And for a, a person writing a biography like myself, who my, my, all of my previous books are general nonfiction, this is my first biography. And I have to say, it's truly one of the, one of the great experiences of my life to be able to try and, and write a life and to, to really focus on not only a life, but other lives in particular. It, it is obviously the title cross of snow a life of henry wadsworth longfellow but i think those of you who take the time to read it will be really pleased to see that it, in my view it is a dual biography and fanny is uh, is uh, really uh, she has um, uh, second billing on the on the on the uh, on the cover uh, with, with the title of the poem the book uh, cross of snow but she really is a major figure. And it was really such a pleasure to be able to research her. And everything I really learned was in this, in this particular structure. So I thought briefly, I would just give a few images for the, the people who came and visited Longfellow House, known as Craigie House back when the Longfellows lived in it and still referred to as Craigie House for a former owner. They came and they certainly saw it from the outside, but very rarely did any of them get inside. So I will just spend a few minutes to take you through a couple of the rooms. Now here's the dining room, and say it's just a dining room. But that was a usually there were seven or eight people there for dinner, and we talk about people who came to have dinner there. I mean, we talk about Charles Dickens who comes for uh, Thanksgiving dinner in 1867. Harriet Beecher Stowe was at that table where Nathaniel Hawthorne, over after dinner one night, gave Henry uh, the idea for the for the uh, poem that became uh, uh, Evangeline. Uh, you just uh, Oscar Wilde has uh, came and had dinner there. Just, just important figure after important figure came and broke bread with the Longfellows. The two portraits at the left you see are by Gilbert Stuart. Those are Fanny's, Fanny's parents, uh, Maria Teresa Gold Appleton, Nathan to the right, and they came to the house after the death of uh, Nathan Appleton. That picture on the right that you see in the image to the left is Fanny Appleton, and also in the image at the right is the very, uh, very famous picture of the three daughters, Annie, Edith, and Alice, made famous by uh, uh, this Thomas Buchanan Reed painting, but which uh, was reproduced this many thousands of times in Carts de Visite and uh, it became this very uh, amazing uh, image. So just go briefly, here's the library. Notice please the busts on top of the, uh, of the, book, of the bookcases. And there are 12,000 books approximately in this house. And, in 50 different languages, uh, or dialects rather, 15 languages, but 50 a total of, of dialects. And Henry could not only read most of them, if not all of them, he was fluent in them. And he really is our first great multiculturalist, even before the term was coined. Uh, he introduced uh, various writers from a number of uh, uh, literary traditions to, to readers in the United States. You have Sophocles, Aeschylus, and Homer on the top of the bookcases. You have a, a statue of Sappho, the Greek poet, 
over there. You can barely see her, slightly see her. That was a gift from Thomas Crawford, the, the, uh, the sculptor. Here's what, what is called the Martha Washington Parlor on the first floor. When George Washington lived here during the uh, siege of Boston, it's, it's Washington's headquarters as part of the name. Uh, not only is this, is this a significant house in the 19th century, it's a significant house in the 18th century because it is where George Washington lived during the entire siege of Boston. His wife, uh, Martha, came up, they stayed there, this was her parlor. Uh, and if you look in the corner, you can see that the, uh, the bust of uh, Fanny Appleton, uh, and you will see it in a little more detail in a later slide. And briefly, we go out into the hall, and if you know the great poem, The Children's Hour, and he says, I hear in the chamber above me the patter of little feet. I love putting up this stanza because you've got two, two lines that have entered the language, two phrases, the patter of little feet, the sound of a door that is opened in voices soft and sweet. From my study, I see in the lamplight descending the broad hall stair. Brave Alice and Laughing Allegra and Edith with golden hair, the three girls that you saw in the previous image. And of course, here is the study. I guess today, if, if they had the phrase man cave in those, in those days, this would be Henry's, this would be where Henry, Henry did his work, where he gathered with his friends, where he celebrated his friends. Where he did all of his great writing. It's also the room where George Washington had, had conducted the councils of war. Uh, that portrait of Henry in the corner was, was painted by uh, his son, Ernest Longfellow. And I point out where it is located because there is Henry seated in pretty much that same spot, circa 1872, 1874, uh, a photograph. So enough of with the, uh, with the interior. I hope that you will all, if you have an opportunity, come to uh, Massachusetts. And if you come, come to Cambridge, uh, please make it a point to come and visit uh, Longfellow House. I want to show you these five images, especially the one on the right. That's the image that appears in the cover. And I'm just so delighted that my, my publisher and my editor picked this for the cover because it really shows Henry at the, at the top of his game, at the height of his powers. It was 1868. It was taken in England during what amounted to a victory tour for Henry. All of his great poems had been written. His Dante translation had been published. He was received by Queen Victoria in Windsor Castle. He went to visit with Lord Tennyson, the poet laureate, who took him out to visit uh, with uh, Julia Margaret Cameron. She took this, this photograph. This is the Longfellow that is known to millions of people throughout the world. His works translated in multiple languages, uh, even in Hebrew and, and, uh, and Latin and uh, Sanskrit, believe it or not. Uh, Longfellow's works were translated, admired, and loved everywhere. And there's the, beard, the bearded Longfellow that everybody knows. Well, you're going to meet that. By the way, that photo at the lower left is with Trap, the dog. That was his son, Char Charlie's dog, who really became Henry's dog. And, and especially after the death of F Fanny, he became a great companion. Trap actually uh, stowed away on the yacht Yalis, uh, the yacht Alice, when it crossed the Atlantic in record time. And they turned it over to an incoming schooner uh, who returned it to Henry. He had quite, quite an amazing pooch, and Henry loved him. But there's also a Longfellow, as both of his wives knew him. And of course, uh, as I mentioned, we're writing about Fanny in this book, and we try to profile her. But there was also Mary, who uh, his first wife, who he deeply loved, and who died after a miscarriage in, in Europe during a trip when he, they traveled to learn more languages just before he was going to take up his position at Harvard. And he was, you can see, was a very handsome man and quite the clothes horse. We talk about that. And these are a few of the images. And here's the, uh, the Eastman Johnson portrait of Henry that's, uh, that's in the house. There are six other uh, very important Eastman Johnson images, and here's a Winslow Homer engraving done from a photograph. So, uh, of course, here's the other character we want to introduce you to is Fanny Appleton. This is more or less how she appeared when Henry met her. She was 17 years old. This portrait hangs in the dining room. She is... Uh, very important figure in this book. And here she is as painted in Paris <coughs> by the important miniature portraits, portraitists, uh, Jean-Baptiste Isabey. Even going back further, and now we talk about the materials and the documents that were so essential. Uh, I photographed every page of Henry's uh, many thousands of pages, actually. Uh, now, these journals are at the Houghton Library, just a half a mile from, from uh, Longfellow House. And here is Henry's journal, Traveling in Spain. He's 20 years old, and he spent three years straight out of Bowdoin College, 
On the day he graduated, he was appointed, he was uh, offered the position to be a full professor to teach modern languages at Bowdoin. But first he had to go to Europe and learn the languages. And so here he is, and of course his father admonishes him at one point to, to wear your American costume, and he pay, pays no attention to that. And this is a self-portrait of Henry, and it's in one of the journals. I have to tell you, we're moving through these pages of the Houghton Library, coming across this image, and the little quote on the right is from Byron, to horse, to horse, it reads. Where is it? Can I read it very carefully? Uh, I can't see it here in front of it. It's to horse, to horse, he quits, forever quits, a sense of peace, though soothing to the soul. He carried with him a copy of Child Harold's pilgrimage. He really conceived and perceived of himself as being a traveler, a cosmopolite was the word he used. And he was learning, constantly learning. And when he got to Italy, he, he, was, he called himself Henri in France. And when he got to Italy, he was, uh, he was Enrique, uh, Enrico. And in Spain, he was Enrique. So he was quite the guy. And these, again, are self-portraits that appear in his journals. Finally, he got, got to Ger Germany, the University of Rodinian. Uh, he met up with his friend Ed Pre Preble. And uh, they did this tongue -in -cheek news newspaper called The Old Dominion. Very revealing. Uh, all of these, so using documents. Well, some of the things is absolutely spectacular. Let me just interject about these 19th century figures is not only do we have objects, but we have documents. We have letters. Henry, Henry uh, at least 10,000 letters of Henry survive in addition to his, his journals. And I have to say, I tried to go through as many of them as I could. Incoming letters to Henry, which, are, which give you both sides of a conversation. And finally, we come back to Miss Appleton. Uh, uh, jumping ahead, he meets her after the death of his first wife. He's traveling. He's to, he's so grief stricken, but he meets this young woman in Switzerland, as it happens, perfectly by chance. And this is kind of what she looked like. She was uh, 18 years old. She was sculpted in Florence. This sculpture, which you saw, which we saw earlier in the parlor in the front, by uh, Lorenzo Bartolini. And this is the young woman that captivated everyone that she met. She was brilliant. She was talented, she was well-educated, she was witty, she was independent, and she traveled to Europe on a grand tour. And this is a, an image of the ship that she traveled on, not by Fanny, but what I found, uh, an image in searching the log books. And this is a, an image of the ship uh, that was sketched by a crew member of the Francis de Paul. Here's one of Fanny's sketches aboard the Francis de Paul from one of her sketchbooks, dated 1835. And when you meet her for the first time in my book, I, I want you to meet her the way she was when Henry met her. I mean, we, I give you a good bit of background in her development, how she was this exquisitely educated young woman. But when you meet her, I want her to be the woman that Henry meets that captivates Henry. She was two inches taller than him. She was five feet 10, perfect posture, tall, piercing brown, almond-shaped eyes, and absolutely uh, uh, not one to take fools gladly. And she loved art. She loved to sketch. She was a writer, uh, over 200,000 words in her journals, recently transcribed by the National Park Service. Kate Hanson Plass, who we'll be talking to presently, supervised that project. I couldn't have done this book without those documents of the Longfellow House. But she also kept this, uh, a number of journals. Here's the first page of her Italy journal, and uh, which she, she, when she passes into Italy, Bellissima Italia, she says. And she, just before she goes, they cross into Italy, she goes to Vaucluz and she goes and she plucks this laurel leaf, which was planted by Petrarch, the, the, the great writer, and she affixes it inside the book and close to 200 years, there it is, still perfectly preserved. And then she kept a separate album of plants. This cutting is open to a, a, a from a, a, at the tomb of Cicero. Now I'm just showing you a selection of Fanny's letters, but you talk about transcribing these letters, which Kate worked on. We have 812 surviving letters. When you talk about trying to get a voice of an individual, what better way, and especially when you write magnificent, beautiful, insightful uh, letters, 812 letters. And having written a book on paper, I can tell you paper was very scarce. I just can't imagine how difficult it was uh, transcribing these letters. I mean, they used every square inch of paper. And if you can see, they, she writes across from left to right. And when she's done, she writes uh, from north to south. Uh, moving these letters around and, and getting the sense uh, is just a heroic effort in my view. But what you get is not only the individual, but the voice. And what I really wanted to do is not only capture his voice, but capture her voice. Now I'm gonna show you briefly 
some of her sketches. And this is a self-portrait without, without question. Here she is at the Castel de Ovo in Naples from the balcony of a seaside palazzo. And I vi actually visited this site, went to Italy last summer with my older brother. We went two old guys in a car, that was a, that was a hoot. But I said, I'll go, but we have to go to Pompeii and Herculaneum, and we have to go see the temple of, uh, of the Neptune Basilica at Paestum in Magna Greca, and to actually see this very site which Fanny sketched. And here she is in La Bella, La Frenza La Bella in Florence. And here's the Colosseum in Rome as she sketched it. As sketched it. Was she a magnificent artist? So you bet. Uh, when she met Henry, they, they traveled for a fortnight. It was, uh, we can't, certainly can't say it was love at first sight. In fact, she was interested in him. He was older. Uh, he was absolutely bedazzled by her. But what she did admire and what she, what she came to really uh, uh, re respect and ultimately love uh, very deeply was his intellect, and it was a melding of intellects. And, and this is in Fanny's hand, and together he was working on some translations of German poems. Together they translated this poem into English, and he later acknowledged that the best lines were done by Fanny. And this is in her hand, this is her holographic copy. And you can see there's the title in German up there, The Castle by the Sea, by Fanny E. Appleton and Henry W. Longfellow. Look who gets top billing. She gave herself top billing. You'd have to love it. Uh, one of the worst decisions Henry ever made, I have to say, and I say this in the book. Uh, Henry, when he returned to Massachusetts and took up his post at Harvard, Fanny returned later, he became, he absolutely became obsessed with her. And he, I, we have to use that word. He was so bedazzled by her. And she did not return the favor. To call it a courtship, I think, is... is is a, a, a loose usage of the word. But he wrote this novel, a Romana Clay, very, very, not a good idea, where he, where he really wrote about his failed pursuit of Fanny Appleton. It was called Hyperion. Uh, this is the first illustrated edition in 1853 by Burke and Foster. And you can see, uh, but he remained, he loved that book. And it wasn't just about the, the, the two of them, it was also about introducing German romanticism and things that he had, uh, literatures and writers to American readers. And the book was in print for many, many years. It's out of print now. It's really worth reading. You can get it on Google Books. It's a, a fascinating book. I enjoyed it. But notice the evening and the morning star. He will write the only love poem that he ever, ever writes, the evening star. And he uses that line in that poem, the evening and the morning star of love. And that's the one. For, well, of the 812 letters that we have of Fanny, only nine uh, we can count Kate and, and I agrees with me on this, I believe, well, from Fanny to Henry. Uh, their contemporaries, the Brownings, Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Robert Browning, we know about their wonderful courtship letters. Well, there really isn't a body of courtship letters between these two. For one, because of the four or five years that he was pursuing her uh, and actually gave up, they didn't correspond at all. How they were, there was a rapprochement, you'll have to read the book. But this is her acceptance. Of, her, of, of his proposal. And I believe, and I, I, I believe that Kate, I believe Kate will back this up, it appears uh, for the first time in print in this book. And it had been basically, I hate to use the word suppressed, but uh, the, the Longfellow family uh, did not want anyone to read this book. Apparently they felt it was a little too personal. I won't read it uh, to you here, but she basically can't wait till he arrives and he uh, cannot oh, wait. Uh, I will Please just just read it in the book. But she awaits his arrival, and he and he writes in his journal that he didn't even take the carriage. He got on. He walked into the four miles into Boston, and a year later he says he writes in his journal, "O oh, day forever blessed that I should in this vita nova of happiness, how full the year has been." Now, of all the many thousands of objects that Chris discussed that are in there, three quarters of a million uh, archival materials. Let me stress that the Longfellow House is, and I really use the word knowingly as a writer and advisedly as unique among National Park Service historic sites, because not only is it a great writer's house and a house that also served as the command headquarters of General Washington, but it is a research center. Everything in there is authentic, original to the Longfellows. I mean, the house went from the Longfellow family to the National Park Service. Everything has been curated and, and, and preserved put in perspective. And of all of them, for me, I have to say of the objects, and you talk about how an object can help, help you understand 
an individual better? How can an object help a writer see, uh, give an extra layer of, of, uh, of color to a, to a character? This is Fanny's uh, wedding present to Henry, and it's a magnificently bound and gilded uh, sketchbook. And inside, these are the sketches that she did in Europe when they met for the first time. And their sketches are quite wonderful, not the same sketches from the Italy ones I showed you previously. But do note at the left, the they described it and dated it on the day of their wedding, July 13, 1843, Mary Ashburton to Paul Fleming. And you talk about the source of one of the great reasons why it really had drifted apart and, and and why she really was very angry with him. He had written in this book. But what she was saying here, I forgive you. And she was basically basically paraphrasing the psalm of life. And she actually says this in a letter, let the dead past bury, the, bury their dead. And she's more or less expressing that in her wedding present. Him, It's quite remarkable. I'm going to show you just a few other uh, objects because I want to bring in Kate. But here's a, a mandarin, just to give you a sense of how uh, wide ranging and popular uh, Longfellow's poetry was. This is a Mandarin fan decorated with a Chinese translation of the Psalm of Life by an official of the Chinese foreign mystery, a calligrapher presented to Henry at a, at a dinner in his house. And it was found uh, as Jim Shea, a, uh, one of Chris's predecessors, a notable Jim Shea, a former site director, that he thought enough about it that he kept it up in his bedroom and it was actually found in a linen, in a linen closet in the 1990s and actually and, and written on it in pencil. Henry tells you exactly what it is. Here's the Franz Liszt portrait. I'm, I'm running short on time, but I, so I'll just run briefly. You see paintings in the house. There's always a story behind the story, every object. You know, it's not like a document where it comes with a text. A, an object has to be curated. So this is a very wonderful portrait of the, of the composer Franz Liszt who Henry met in Rome during that same European trip, 1868-1869. He was having a portrait done by GBA, GPA Healy. He saw a picture of Liszt on the easel, and he, uh, uh, Healy said, well, I, I know him. Would you like to meet him? And he had taken some religious orders. They went up Christmas Eve, and answering the door was uh, Franz Liszt holding that candle. And Henry whispered under his breath, Mr. Healy, you must paint that for me. And he commissioned this portrait. And there isn't an object or an item or a painting in this house. And I've walked through with the various uh, uh, curators and archivists. There's always something different. There's always something that turns up. I like to think of it as a little Herculaneum, where something magical is always going to is always going to uh, reveal itself. And I will not dwell on this, but if you know the horrible circumstances of Fanny Longfellow's uh, uh, just catastrophic uh, accident that caused her death. She was clipping uh, locks of hair from one of her daughters, and there was an accident with a candle. And I have to say, when I was shown this particular object among three others, this is what she was working on is in Fanny's handwriting, Edith's hair, July 1861. And there's that golden hair, as golden today as it was then. And you talk about an object that speaks beyond exactly what it is. It uh, it just it just uh, resonates in many ways. So here are two photo, uh, photographs. I believe they were the last taken of Fanny before she died, uh, and also the last of Henry before his wife died. They came into the possession of Bowdoin College in, uh, in Brunswick, Maine in 2017. I believe they're being published for the first time in this book. I'm very pleased to have them. The studio portraits, very unusual in that Fanny is looking straight at the camera. Usually she's a profile. The favorite moment of every day for both Henry and Fanny was when at night she read to him. He, he, he was, the first his first recollection of Fanny when he met her was her musical voice, and the highlight of every day was reading together hundreds of books, and they discussed them and they discussed them with other people, and that she wrote letters about them. And the only sketch we have that Fanny made of Henry is this one, where he's see, seated in his chair in the study, presumably after an evening of reading, and the one on the right. Where Hen which Henry sketched to Fanny, where I believe we can suggest he's probably uh, been reading for the night, and there he is seeing her a moment of, of rest. It's quite a remarkable uh, pair of pictures that kind of gives you a sense of the individual beyond the form of portraits. The picture at the left is Fanny's favorite portrait of Henry by Samuel Lawrence, and the picture at the right is Henry's favorite picture of Fanny, and I say that to, as I segue into this, 
final consideration of a room in the house, not only the consideration of the room in the house, but a document. So everything is kind of coming together here. We have a room in the house and we have a couple of objects and we have a document, a holographic document that is in the Houghton Library at Harvard. And I have to say going through and as uh, people who work with archives know, you don't, you don't shuffle the paperwork. I mean, you keep them as they appear. And going through this particular box of materials when I came across this single sheet of paper and the envelope that it had been tucked in. And you're looking at the first eight lines of a sonnet, Henry being the thrifty uh, Yankee the, that he was, he never wasted a sheet of paper. So the uh, first eight lines are on this side of the sheet and the final six are on the other. But it is a contemplation, it begins. In the long sleepless watches of the night, a, face, a gentle face, the face of one long dead, looks at me from the wall where around its head, the night lamp casts a halo of pale light. That's that portrait of Fanny in the bedroom that he looks at every night. Here in this room, she died, he goes on. I will not go through the whole poem, you'll have to read it. But uh, it's a contemplation of this, of this picture that he looks at every night. And then and you flip the page and on the other side, he writes about there is a mountain in the distant west that deep defining, but sun defying in its deep ravines displays a cross of snow upon its side. Such is the cross I wear upon my breast these 18 years through all the changing scenes and seasons, changeless since the day she died. Well, I go to great lengths to document that he is writing about this particular mountain, this particular painting that he has seen by Thomas Moran. He dates it July 10th, 1879, the 18th anniversary of the day she died. They had been married 18 years, so 18 is very significant. And everything comes together. And, uh, and if you wonder why I chose this Cross of Snow for the title, well, this is pretty much it in a nutshell. And I'll just conclude my formal remarks with this other photo. We started with an image of uh, Longfellow House. We'll conclude with one. Uh, and, and Charlie ran away after Fanny died and he joined the Union Army and he fought in the Civil War and he got camp fever one year one year, and he, he was wounded, grievously wounded the next. And in both instances, Henry went south to uh, be with him and to help nurse him back to health. During the first trip, he was staying in a hotel while Charlie was uh, staying in the home of a Unitarian minister and he wrote to his son Ernest it was, it was a morning, it wasn't Christmas day, but it was a Sunday morning and he could hear the bells chiming. And because he was in Washington, DC and he could hear the, the artillery shells off in Virginia. And there was this, this extraordinary paradox of the carol, the church bells on the one hand and the artillery on the other. And he, when he came home, he wrote this poem, which he seems to have a special resonance, I think, of the times in which we live right now. I heard the bells on Christmas day, their old familiar carols play and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. So that's it, and I hope I didn't go too long, but I would certainly like to invite Kate hansen Plast to come in and join the conversation at this point. Kate? Thank you, Dad. Hi, Kate. Uh, thank, you, thank you so much. That was uh, great fun to listen to. Um, I'll invite anyone who has been coming up with their own questions to chat directly to the organizers um, and I'll keep an eye on those. Okay. I wanted just to start out, um, you were limited in time tonight and of course you were limited in, in pages in your book. Uh, can you tell us about one of those objects or one of those stories that didn't quite fit and you didn't get to include? Uh, there are a couple, but thank you for asking, because I feel terrible. Uh, one of the many days that I spent uh, with you, Kate, and with Chris Worth and uh, Dave Daly and uh, all of the other great staff there, the remarkable, outstanding staff, I had come in and you had a, a number of, of textiles out for me, about a dress of Fanny that survived, uh, that you, you had, actually, she had a photograph, we determined to wearing that. But there was also a, a dress, uh, it looked like a costume uh, of, uh, that apparently was kind of a Breton, Breton dress that was made for, uh, apparently made for uh, the daughter Alice in a, in a performance of Evangeline. And we didn't know that, again, it, it's a dress and there's no legend, nobody wrote a note to say what it was, but you through really wonderful detective work had, had, uh, 
and determined that it was the dress that Alice wore not only for this uh, this performance apparently of a of a production of Evangeline, but there was a photograph and it had been colored in and it was precisely the dress. And I so wanted to get that in, but I just didn't have a place in the narrative where it, it worked into the narrative. And and uh, sadly, it, it didn't make it. And I feel terrible even now, but that, that would have to be the number one object that didn't make it in. And there were others, but that's the one that hurts me the most. <clears throat> Okay. I know there were others. I I know you uh, you spent hours and hours looking through um, so many of the the resources that we have just at Longfellow House and then um, the other repositories. I'm I'm curious how you were able to make connections between repositories. You spent so much time with us, but in looking at the in reading the book, the stories you're telling you were able to pull in resources from the Mass Historical Society, obviously from Houghton, um, and, and how were you able to, and, and sometimes very far afield, like talking about tracking down the Moran painting, and what drove you to, to making those network of connections? I, I, I wish I could describe the process. It's, it, it did, I have worked on it for 12 years, let's put it that way. Even, uh, I, when I first wrote an essay for Smithsonian Magazine in 2007 on the occasion of Henry's bicentennial, that's when I determined it was the house that really encouraged me that there is a great story here, a, a number of great stories, and the materials are here. So it's really taken a lot of time, and I really do believe, as a writer, I've always believed that you need to know 10 times as much as you ever put in your book, as you tell the reader. And so it takes, for me, it's a long process. I'm really, I never really feel comfortable about writing until I know. And it's a, a number I like, maybe do I know 20 times as much, or maybe it's seven or eight times, but I really have to know a lot. And I think part of that process is to really read it and to cull it and to see what fits. And then of course, the most important thing for me as a writer is making the transitions. And it really pleases me to, to have you point out that yes, I might go from an object to a letter or to a letter that was received or to a document trying to synthesize it all into making a narrative, a story, because storytelling matters to me a great deal. I want you not only to learn something about uh, these two people, but I want you to be, I want you to enjoy it. I want you to be entertained. It's a story. And really everything is about storytelling as far as I'm concerned. So thank you for the question. I wish I, I could explain it more, in more detail than that, but it's, it's really a professional process. It's taken me 60 years to develop. On that storytelling, you uh, you call this a dual biography and Fanny and Henry, Henry and Fanny are clearly the, the lead figures. I'll note that the, I read the, the review in the New Yorker and uh, the reviewer pointed out that Longfellow, Henry Longfellow gets put on the back burner for 20 pages while you narrate Fanny's European sojourn. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, he can call it the back burner if he wants. Uh, <laughs> what he's saying there, I think, in code is, uh, is this book about Henry Longfellow or is it about, I don't know, I didn't write the piece and, and, uh, and I, I'm very, I like the piece and it's fine. It's 36, you can't, 35 or 3,600 words in the New Yorker, you can't beat that. So that's good, that's good attention. And, but that particular note, uh, I, th I think was, there's a suggestion that I'm, I'm, I'm perhaps spending too much time with Fanny and, and I'll plead guilty as charged. I don't make any apologies for it. She's a remarkable woman. She has never had her just due in a book. This is the first time she is quite extraordinary. You're not just a loving, brilliant, uh, important woman in his life, but I believe a very important, I use the word nutrient. She's not a collaborator. She doesn't really write poetry with him, but she gives him ideas. She comments on, she's very critical. And he's going slowly. At one point she says, I will be a spur to his Pegasus. And she uses that phrase twice. And she gives him an idea for the arsenal at Springfield poem because she's this extraordinary pacifist. And she sees these thousands of muskets the Springfield Armory, and she has this image of, of, of the devil's organ, these, these, the, this, this, this music of, the, of, the, of, of, uh, of, of a dance of death, and he writes the, spring, the arsenal at Springfield. 
not only suggested by Fanny, but urged by Fanny to do it. And when he's doing his, his volume of translations of, uh, of poems, she, she writes in her journal, working on our book. She called it our book. They worked on it together. So she's a very important person, and, uh, not only in his life, but, but I think uh, in, in the creation of the work. And also, let me just say that that, 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 that letter where she accepts uh, his proposal of marriage, it hadn't been published in earlier books. Even Andrew Hyland, he did the six volume uh, edition of Longfellow's works. And he didn't quote that, but what, all he said about it was that about that letter was she accepted unconditionally, unconditionally surrendered is what he said. Now, if you know anyone who knows anything about Fanny Hamlin, she doesn't unconditionally surrender to anything. She had made a decision and she, and she was good with it. And what Highland then also says, what is exceedingly consequential about this, as important as the letter is, which he wouldn't quote, was that it ushered in the most productive period of his life. He finally achieved his happiness and the great, great works of his lifetime. He will, he will just write one after another. It's an importantly, it's a fabulously important and fruitful period in his life. And uh, so if I have spent a little more time than some might like writing about Fanny, well, I'm sorry about that. Actually, I'm not. I'm very happy to have done it. <laughs> but thanks for, thank you for asking about it. I'll say I'm happy to see uh, Fanny get a almost equal billing in the book. I know we've got a bunch of questions coming in, so I'm going to turn to some of those. Okay. Um, Paul would like you to talk a little bit about uh, Giles Corey of the Salem Farms. Uh, what inspired Longfellow to write the play? And he says he seems as appalled by the fanaticism of Puritan Salem as Arthur Miller. I wonder if the play also influenced Miller's The Crucible. <sighs> Boy, I'm, I'm again, I, I'm, I think you broke up a little bit, Kate. So, uh, can't say I followed the question. Maybe you could give it to me again. I was looking for for your thoughts on Giles Corey of the Salem Farms and the the inspiration of Longfellow's inspiration and whether Arthur Miller was inspired by Longfellow. Arthur Miller. I, I can't. I don't know. I can't answer that question. I, again, I'm not. Uh, I'm not studying 20th century influences of, of Longfellow. Longfellow did fall out of favor amongst many, many, uh, uh, in many circles. The, mo the modernists ejected him from the canon. That he that he might have inspired Arthur Miller is fresh to me, is new to me, and I, I wish I could comment more fully on it, but I can't. But it's certainly something I'll, I'll, I'll investigate and look into. It is interesting, but it was not the purview of this book to 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 kind of get into that. And I think if this Caller who looks at the book, he or she will see why it just isn't something that I that I had. It's a 460-page book as it is, and uh, I couldn't get to all of these considerations. I was really focused on the focused on the lives of the, of the principles. Uh, a couple of people would like to know what in your research was the most surprising thing you found out. Surprising. Surprising. Okay, well, I guess, um, interesting, Henry's, Henry's first trip to Europe as a, as a, he was 18 years old, he just, 18, you know, let's pause for a second, 18 years old, he just graduated from college. And on his graduation day, he's, he's the Board of Trustees of Bowdoin College, they vote to establish this chair for the teaching of languages, it'll be only the fourth college in the United States to do this. And they've gotten a bequest from the widow of James Bowden to establish this chair. And so who should teach it? And they say, well, we've got this brilliant young lad, Henry Longfellow, whose father also happens to be a member, a trustee of the college. That doesn't hurt, but he's brilliant. He, he graduates fourth in his class. He was a wonderful student. They offer him the job, his father underwrites it. And to send this 18 year old lad in 1826 to Europe for three years, and it was just, and I call that chapter awakening because he arrives there at 18 and he does, he is awakened in many, many palpable ways, which you'll have to read the chapter. So yes, I did a little work and, and Henry uh, was enlightened and became, a, a, achieved his maturity in many ways, shall we say. And uh, to, to, to identify uh, Florencio Gonzalez, the, the 
woman that he fell in love with in Madrid. And it really messed things up. He stayed in Madrid for six months and his father kept writing him, you're supposed to be learning Italian now. You're supposed to, you gotta get to Germany. Finally, he leaves Spain and he goes to Italy and he falls in love with a, a woman there, Giulia Persiani. And again, um, uh, he doesn't write about these things. Henry is, a, is very closed mind. He respects women too much to say anything disparaging or demeaning or even uh, intimate about them. So really finding details. And it's important because he gets to Italy and he stays there for a year. And meanwhile, he has a friend from Bowdoin, Ned Preble, who's waiting for him in Germany. And the only thing that gets him going is a letter from his father that said, well, you've been taking so, such a long time. You're not going to be a full professor at Bowdoin anymore. And they're going to cut your salary. So that gets him going. And he said, but he also stands up and he says, I will, I will not accept anything less than the professorship. And he makes a deal on the, on the salary they'll pay him. But uh, I guess surprising was to learn of these other, uh, these other relationships that he established and which were wonderful awakening relationships. And they were very warm and, and, uh, and they, they helped shape the man he became. So I guess, I guess those were among of the more gratifying surprises that I was able to find and to document as best as I could. Okay. All right. Um, we have a, a, we had a group, a couple into a theme. Um, we have questions about uh, the, your perspective on Longfellow and Poe, on Longfellow and Tennyson, and and vice versa. Well, the, I, I write about the Longfellow Poe uh, to call it relationship is not the right word, but uh, I, th I think Poe, for some reason, decided that uh, he detested Longfellow and he accused him of plagiarism without any justification for doing that. He uh, it was a ten year. He called it my little Longfellow war. And he was really brutal. And, and this has really been very thoroughly written about by others. So I have to also say that I, I allow the others, who other writers who, are, who have written about this, I give you the citations if you want to know more about the specifics of that. Uh, but I report it. Uh, but, it's, but it's not something new that really felt relevant here. But, but uh, what, what is really interesting about, uh, about Henry's response is that he never answered him. And he told some after Poe had died, and he was giving William Winter some advice. He said, "You're young. You're just starting your career. Let me give you some advice. You will receive a lot of." And he doesn't name Poe, but it, Poe had they had been discussing. There had been a volume of Poe's poetry there, but clearly he was thinking of Poe. He said, "People will will criticize you. They'll condemn you. They'll say things about you. My advice is to say nothing. Do not respond to your critics. It's the best way to respond. The best way to respond," he basically said was how the readers respond. And I found it very, very interesting that the only book that Henry ever dedicated to anyone, I mean, he never did, dedicated a book to Fanny. He, I think the poems on slavery were dedicated to uh, Channing, but, but, but uh, The Seaside and the Fireside, he has a long poem, which he dedicates to his readers. And he thanks his readers, the people who have supported him and made him the person that he is. He thanks his readers and he dedicates the book to that. So I think the, the Longfellow Poe relationship is kind of one-sided. There was an essay written by a, by, a, by a person we still haven't determined who the identity is. He was written under the uh, pseudonym Outis, O-U-T-I-S, a Greek word meaning nobody. I suggest in the book that, that it's Cornelius Conway Felton, the classicist, could have been Sumner, could have been the two of them together, who knows, but refuted all of Poe's charges and Poe actually had to, re had to retract them at some point later uh, because they were they were patently vi uh, vicious spiteful uh i admire poe but uh, he had problems and he took a lot of them out on henry tennyson and henry were were lord tennyson they were friendly when uh, uh and tennyson was very funny he's cute about this he was the poet laureate and in england uh, henry outsold him on his home turf and he actually said well somebody said uh, uh, you were very successful with your poetry. He said, yes, I made 3,000 pounds last year, but Longfellow made five. And uh, uh, whatever it was, maybe it was 2,000 and 3,000, but the point was Longfellow was outselling him. But he truly admired him, and Henry admired uh, Tennyson. And it was Tennyson, in fact, who took Henry to Julia Margaret Cameron's house and left him there. He said, uh, 
uh, Ms. Cameron, this is Henry Longfellow, he's a poet, Mr. Longfellow, this woman is a photographer, she's going to take the picture. So they had a nice uh, relationship, as, as I understand it, they, they respected each other's work and uh, the quality of their work. It was a very mutually rewarding friendship. We are coming up on eight o'clock, uh, so that we might have time for one or, or maybe two more questions. Uh, Jim would like you to speak a little bit about the breadth and depth of the Longfellow Library. I know that's one of the things that first brought you to the house is the books and the, the libraries, the, the historic libraries value for researchers. Okay, the library, you mean the library in the Longfellow House, the 12,000 books. Uh, I, don't, I don't have a chance really to uh, discuss the books at great length. I do comment on, on the quality, on the character of them. It's cosmopolitan to the extreme. He and Fanny, it's one thing you can say about Longfellow's books is that they were read. They were read by Longfellow and they were read by Fanny while she was alive. And then he writes a sonnet towards the end of his life. He, he devotes it entirely uh, uh, to, to his books. Uh, but to, to get into the, uh, he was he was an, an antiquarian second or third. He did buy a couple of books for their uh, obvious antiquarian value. He did buy one incunable uh, volume of Petrarch and he and uh, Plutarch. I beg your pardon, Plutarch. And, and he off clearly did not need another copy of Plutarch. But what he wanted was the 500 year old book. But for the most part, he brought books to read, but he loved them. He, he took great care of them. He never kept a catalog, but he knew where everything was. He, he shelved everything, I like to say, associatively. If any of you have ever been, visited the, the London Library in, in England, in London, uh, they have their own. We got pretty far without any technical difficulties, but I think we might have just run into them. But uh, but it's good timing because here we are at pretty close to eight o'clock. Um, I think we've lost Nick, but uh, I wanted to say, uh, you know, thank you, Nick, for your talk this evening, and thank you everyone for uh, joining us for our first foray into virtual programming. I'd say, you know, for me, this has been a, a, a thoroughly enjoyable and edifying evening. Um, I hope that you'll all keep an eye on the, the Longfellow House website calendar um, and also our newsletter for future, future events. Um, our next virtual event will be the, the Golden Rose Award presentation and poetry reading with the New England Poetry Club and the Friends of the Longfellow House on uh, the afternoon of Sunday, June 14th. Um, that day we'll have the opportunity to, to meet and hear from uh, the poet Susan Howe. So um, please stay tuned and, and you know, thank you again for joining us. muted now but thank you chris thank you everyone i don't know if my last bit was heard but uh, i did want to thank you and the staff for hosting this and for bringing all these people together here tonight and uh, for giving me an opportunity to, to speak about the new book and look forward to seeing you all again when 
Times improve. Thank you so much, Nick. Yeah, your, your, uh, your camera froze up and I think your microphone froze up too, but it was great hearing from you tonight. And um, uh, I'm sure everyone's looking forward to reading the book. So um, thanks for being with us and for the great talk as well. Yes, for all of us. And so we'll, we'll all learn uh, technique wise. And, uh, and as, as uh, events go forward, we'll, we'll improve and get, I'll improve certainly, and, and we'll make a smoother presentation. But uh, it's been great fun and thank you thank you for hosting this tonight great thanks nick thanks everyone else too okay